tainted. It's a hard word. It's a tough word. When you hear it used, you find your lip curl tainted. But what does that have to do with species? What I invite you to do today is consider species conservation in the context of two things, an overriding human desire to create and defend discrete categories while simultaneously embracing entities which defy those very same categories. Now, what I'd like to do is start with a quiz. And I'm going to show you a few pictures of animals. And I'd like you to ask yourself, are those tainted or not? So elephant, tainted? How about bison? Wolves? Tainted? Anteater, pick the mother or the baby. Either one of them tainted. How about furries? <laughs> ah, tainted. So this is a very interesting subculture found at least in the United States of people who feel a particular affinity for a species, particularly anthropomorphic creatures, and who feel the need to dress up as their creature and then meet in conventions and do <laughs> furry-like things in conventions. So the question is, is this a result of some odd perversion of the modern age? Or in fact, is it part of a very long tradition? 40,000 years ago, this sculpture was carved from a mammoth tusk, body of a human, head of a lion. Part of a long tradition extending up through Egyptian deities, heads of animals, bodies of humans, werewolves, weird tigers, weird jaguars, hybrids between the spiritual and the natural, and then more contemporaneously in fantasy fiction and in video games. So think again, this discomfort, this sort of anxiety, the slight nervousness you feel when you look at this image. What is it drawn? Where does that kind of thing come from? Where, why are we so concerned about things which straddle these categories? These were the questions that were addressed by a very prominent uh, French anthropologist, Nate Claude Lévi-Strauss, in a very influential book called The Raw and the Cooked, in which he maintained that humans are hardwired to create and defend discrete categories, and even to censure those things which fall in between those categories. But he, we're not here to have a friend, French theory of anthropology lecture. We're talking about species conservation. So where would this kind of dichotomy find itself in the world of species conservation? And I'm here to suggest to you that this is the dichotomy we've been hearing about. This is the dichotomy in the heart of much of what we're talking about, hybrid and pure. And it's an important question for us to ask because it underlies many of the important parts of, of the discussions of species conservation, past, present, and future. And I want to give you a little story about one of the cases where this is playing itself out. North American bison used to number in the tens of millions in North America, all the way from Alaska down through central Mexico. Marvelous animals, huge herds. Forget the passenger pigeon. We should be talking about bison. But then through one of these spasms of commercial uh, horror, we decimated the bison herds. This is a pile of bison skulls, for example. And after the result of this intense commercial hunting and habitat loss, bison were reduced to a small number of animals, just in the number of a couple of hundred. They were prevented from going extinct by two different groups. The first was the American Bison Society, based in the Bronx Zoo in New York. And the second were ranchers. Ranchers were very interested in trying to create an animal which could survive the rigors of the Great Plains winters and could, could use less water than, than animals uh, that cattle did in the, in the Southern Plains. So how to do this? Well, we're, they're going to try to cross this bison and, and the cow. And they did so. It was very difficult. But they produced a set of hybrids most of which didn't survive. But they managed to create a set of bison that looked like bison, but had cattle genes in them. So when attempts were made by the American Bison Society to restore bison to their proper place in the wild, through these kinds of efforts, this being a horse-drawn set of carriages that the American Bison Society provided to bring bison from New York into a preserve in Oklahoma. The bison that were released in some of these important places were thought to be pure bison. But in fact, they were tainted. They were tainted by cattle genes. 
And so when you look now at many of the bison out in the wild, they look like bison, they behave like bison, they respond to fire and grazing and predators, they defend their calves from wolves like bison, but they have cattle genes in them. So let's go back to our quiz. So there was one other animal I wanted to single out with, a, with, a, with the tainted label, and that's the wolf. So not all wolves, but black wolves in particular. So it turns out that most of the geneticists who study this believe that the genes coding for the coat color black are dog genes. They're not wolf genes, they're dog genes. So that this wolf, most likely in its past, had an ancestor who had a particular fondness for a dog. So some of, the, some of the packs of wolves that are taking down elk, rearranging energy flows, bringing back songbirds, restoring bison and beavers and all of these things through their top-down predatory action are in fact tainted. What does this matter to us? The bison are behaving like bison. They're restored their bisonness. The wolves are behaving like wolves. We have wolf behavior returned. They're not pure. But then it turns out that the notion of purity really is a fundamental human value, one of these categories we're talking about, and that the purity is not found in nature and species. You will not find this category. It does not exist out there as a self-declared category. And when we ask why things aren't pure, we should be looking in the mirror at ourselves, because it turns out that with this work on the human genome has shown some of our relatives had fondness for other kinds of hominids. So we have Neanderthal genes in our genome. We have Denisovan genes, another early hominid. And in fact, some eight to 9% of the human genome that's been typed is from viruses, virus genes in the human. So we ourselves are not pure. And in fact, we rather like to use this ability to create hybrids for our own ends. So when the peregrines went extinct in the eastern part of North America, Stan Temple and others of his colleagues looked around to find peregrines to breed together and to release and to, to restore peregrines into their proper peregrineness in the northeastern part of the United States. They used peregrines from five to seven different strains, ranging all the way from Australia, put them in a bottle, shook them up, let them go, and my God, you can see peregrines in Washington taking out pigeons, and it thrills you to see that. They're hybrids. Does that matter to you? Does it matter that we're proposing to restore passenger pigeons that are tainted, or thylacines that have passed through a Tasmanian devil, or mammoths, or any of the rest of these things? In fact, we can even do this kind of thing, we are told. That is, it turns out, the speculation is, that much of the unexpressed genome in birds would code for dinosaurs if you could turn it on. So here, perhaps we could create an ostradile, an ostrich, and a dinosaur. Now, what would be wrong with that if we were able to do that? Where would we put these hybrid animals if we proposed to create them? Well, in a typical forward-sighted uh, human action, that's ironic, um, we have created hybrid habitats. So it is almost impossible now to find places that you might call natural or virgin that through climate change and through the direct impacts of human action, we have changed the world in ways that maybe would warrant the return of these sorts of animals. So when we look at the hybrid question, I invite you to consider the fact that we are not looking at the full length of the spectrum. In fact, most of our attention is to the left-hand side of this. Oh, bison, yes, bison, no. And I've been part of what are sort of now the modern bison gene wars. Got to be pure, can't be pure, take them out, put them in, whatever it is. So, but that is only a portion of this spectrum that we are looking at. It extends through the passenger pigeons. We've talked about that. Perhaps the ostradile. And even, look at the far right, cyborg moths. Yes, in fact, people with support from the US government and others have produced machine insect hybrids, and in fact, machine mollusk hybrids. There's a cyborg snail as well. What are we supposed to think about that? And by the way, where do you think the habitat for a cyborg moth might be? So we return to where we started with the word tainted, usually conceived of as corrupted and contaminated. But you read a little farther down in the definition, and you find a little more texture to this tinged, imbued slightly. 
easing up a bit. Then we go to hybrid, entered the English language about 1600 from Latin, meaning mongrel. But again, a little patience, we look a little closer, and it turns out that hybrid was originally designed as a word to apply to the specific offspring of a tame sow and a wild boar. Hybrid, something that humans wanted. If we pick up the word hybrid and we turn it over, we find a putative root to another word, hubris. The common Greek word hubris with a root with hybrid. Hubris, excessive pride. Excessive human pride. Pride in a conviction that there is such a thing as purity. Pride in a conviction that if we create a hybrid, it will remain exactly the way we wanted that hybrid to be. And pride in the conviction that it is possible not to act. So I suggest to you today that our concern should not be with tainted species or with hybrid species, but nay, in fact, with hubris. Thank you.